When we began the Marla Festival at the end of September, Gilbert Kaplan, you remember, came and gave a very good address to the yes. audience. And uh, by way of saying how delighted he was to be at NEC, he gave me a book of his. And the book is of every known photograph taken of Marla during his life. Mm. But also includes, at the end of the book, some representations of him by artists. Mm -hmm. One of the artists is Schoenberg. Yes. And the picture that I found incredibly moving is the painting that he made of Mahler's uh, funeral when, right. he's, when he is about to be buried. Right. And I had this very much in mind when I looked at it, and I thought about the six piano pieces that we're going to have as part of this concert, with the last piece actually being um, dedicated to Mahler and, and the memory of Mahler and that, and that particular occasion. It, it makes me wonder about the relationship between those two. Because there you have Mahler, the quintessential romantic 19th century composer who lived into the 20th century. And there you have Schoenberg, uh, blazing new trails, going in a, in a completely different direction, if you like. Right. What was the relationship between them? And what did Mahler make of that direction? Uh, the relationship was uh, wary at first, and then very good. Uh, Katharina gave me quite an outline of that. And Schoenberg even wrote an article uh, late in his life saying uh, in the article, Mahler was a saint. And he was trying probably there to uh, make up the difference between what he had not understood of Mahler when he was younger and what he came to understand. And he came to believe that Mahler was a very great figure, a towering figure in the history of music. But we think their first encounter was uh, perhaps uh, that the fact that both Schoenberg and Alma studied uh, with uh, Zemlinsky, and that uh, we know that Schoenberg heard Mahler's first symphony and is supposed to have remarked that he couldn't find much of worth in it. Uh, and then that Mahler heard some of Schoenberg's music and said, it seems as if it may be very great, but I'm too old, I'm not of his generation, so I don't fully understand it. So from that uh, ambiguity came something much more solid and uh, Schoenberg uh, had written later Transfigured Night, which Mahler adored. And uh, then when Schoenberg wrote the first quartet, Mahler said, again, I'm confounded. There's so much music in this. I'm having trouble sorting it out. But Schoenberg uh, had come to love Mahler's second symphony and Mahler's fourth symphony. And by the time that Mahler passed in 1911, they were, they were friends. And they had a great respect for each other. And this was expressed in many ways. Uh, Schoenberg then, of course, went to the funeral of Mahler in 1911, and what I'm about to say is not written in a book anywhere, but Rudolf Kolisch, who was Schoenberg's brother-in-law, and I were chess partners all during the 70s when Rudy was on the faculty here and a great, great teacher from 1971 to 81, and he told me quite a number of things, uh, one of which was that the sixth movement of the Schoenberg Opus 19 pieces was a direct memory of Mahler and that Schoenberg composed it in his head walking home from the funeral and went in the house and the piece was already written. He just got out a pencil and put it down. Mm -hmm. And that piece features two chiming chords, one higher and one mm -hmm. lower, which uh, were the church bells, apparently, that were chiming uh, at the end of the funeral. Uh, and and uh, so the phrase where at one point, a kind of a yearning figure. Kolisch told me it was Schoenberg saying, ah, Mahler to those words, to those notes. There's even an octave in it, I think. A, a, a what? An octave. Oh, yeah, Schoenberg wrote octaves still at this time. Mm -hmm. You're right, but this was rare. And this was probably Mahler's influence also. Schoenberg came later to proclaim that octaves were the devil in music and should not be used. And <laughs> he called this the, the period of octave prohibition. He was proud that it more or less matched American prohibition of alcohol in terms of its time frame. And, and his last octave for many years was the final chord of Piero Lunaire. Mm -hmm. And then it didn't, octaves did not make it back into his music until the 1940s. Uh, but he uh, was very fond of Mahler, apparently, uh, on, and very much in reverence of Mahler's integrity. Well, was the relationship with Mahler, was it, was it on a peer basis, or did he come to Mahler for advice, or was it the young man seated at the, the, the foot of the master? How was it? it, was, it well, Schoenberg was born in 1874 and Mahler in 1861, I believe, right? So, there's an age gap there that at that age in life you consider to be uh, younger, older. When you get both older, then it's not that way. 
and, and uh, you become colleagues. Um, I think Schoenberg um, felt that Mahler was uh, a voice of the past, and Mahler felt that Schoenberg was a voice of the future, and that they had respect and even admiration, uh, which they didn't have initially, but that that admiration grew on both sides, and it became uh, something which is written up in uh, Schoenberg's book, Style and Idea, uh, something you could see was very emotional for Schoenberg. I mean, when you listen to the, to a work of Schoenberg's like uh, Pelias und Melisande, I mean that really is out of Mahler's world. Sure, it is. They 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 were in the same world for quite a while. It was late Romantic period, and and there's highly chromatic, but still very tonal music, and rich counterpoint, and those qualities of German music at this time, uh, which pervade both composers. Uh, Sehnsucht, meaning longing. And as one German student corrected me in class, no, Mr. Heiss, it means longing for longing. <laughs> and, and then the other one that uh, applies is Weltschmerz, world pain or, or burden of history or a struggle with uh, the relationship between the present and the future. And uh, that's in, in both of their musics. So uh, it's perfectly proper, I think, for my program to be entitled The Aura of Mahler because Schoenberg, Berg, and Webern were uh, in Vienna with him. They knew him. They lived in the same society, and they had the same anxieties and, and dreams and wishes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it might be said that, that um, they composed the music that Mahler might have written had he been born later. Well, if, if Schoenberg was, was the future and Mahler represented the 19th century, is there an element in Mahler which is prescient of the future yes, as well? Yes, of course. Uh, the elevation of, of the uh, earthy, and, and uh, folk music and uh, German bands and, and uh, that uh, taking the high-low diversion in music, high being the cultivated art and low being the vernacular art, and bringing these together, that, that's a connection for sure. Uh, let me think. Another might be uh, the idea of, of uh, complexity as an expression of, of richness and of the reality of, of uh, the, the modern world. Uh, a third, of course, is length. Mahler writes ever longer and bigger pieces. And one of the strange things that happened after Schoenberg's early work, which, in which Pierrot and Peleus, for instance, were, were magnificently long, mm -hmm. as Carl Maria von Weber uh, said of, of uh, Schubert, I think it was, uh, he, he believes in heavenly length. And uh, so that idea of, of extension and, and longing and lasting a long time is pervasive in Mahler, and it's pervasive in early Schoenberg. And as you will see on my program on November 15th, uh, what uh, one reaction to that was, was that the composers became interested in highly short, condensed, compressed forms, like haiku or, or um, tiny paintings of mm -hmm. Vermeer, for instance, where a lot is said, vast things are said in 10 seconds. Yeah. Emily Van Diver is going to play the uh, Opus 11 of Webern, which is uh, called Three Short Pieces for Piano. It's in three movements, and the entire thing lasts a minute and 50 seconds. So that is Mahler um, from the other yeah. side of the scale. Yeah. I'll I give you my experience of Webern when I was a, a very young man. I went to see Pierre Boulez with the BBC Symphony Orchestra at the Royal Festival Hall in, in London. Mm -hmm. And it was a long program, but it started with Webern, six orchestral pieces over six. Then right. I think there was Miraculous Mandarin and Rite of Spring and one of his own own works. It got to uh, the Webern, which started the program, and at the end of it, I just wanted to go home because it was enough. Mm -hmm. It was it was a compressed Mahler symphony Good. in what six and a half minutes, there whatever you go. it is. There you go. That 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 idea of compression uh, is what follows from his idea of expansion, and that very close uh, at very close range. Uh, I want to tell a little joke here too that's relevant to all of this. Um, they're all Austrians, you know, and, and uh, of course uh, they are very close to the orbit of, of Germany and German music, and they're said to be part of it. But there's a saying about the difference between the Austrians and the Germans. It's this. Uh, the situation in, uh, let me get this right, the situation in Germany is serious, but not hopeless. The situation in Austria is hopeless, but not serious. <laughs> <laughs> And so I think we'll feel that uh, duality of, of coexistence of, of different kinds of states of length, of brevity, of uh, tonality, of uh, atonality, of 
highly emotional, uh, overt on the surface, and then more compressed emotionality from within. It's going to be an interesting concert, and it's got a lot of... Uh, now we have Mahler in, in, in Mahler this. is in the concert, of yeah. course. So tell us about this little known. I think I've only, ever, only ever heard it once. A chamber well, work by Mahler. Mahler did but, it. But sort of completed by Schnitke. Of more than that, even. Mahler in 19, or 1876 wrote a small adagio for piano quartet. It was intended to be part of a larger piece, and it was not ever uh, extended. And it's a charmer, and I think it's full of talent and very precocious for a young 16-year-old. Uh, my dear friend Ben Zander calls it a trifle, and I call it uh, instead a highly enticing and significant trifle. And uh, what goes on from that, then, is the possibility of other music. So along comes Alfred Schnitke in 1988, I believe it is, and makes a whole work based on that Mahler quartet, which is actually a part of the uh, Schnitke piece. Uh, it's, it's more than quoted, it, it, it inhabits the Schnitke piece. So we're going to program, by the way, um, Kurtog, and uh, work by myself and work by one of our students, Katie Balsh, which are uh, like that. They are responses to the earlier music, uh, but they're music of our time and, and made by the individuals that we are. So there's a, a tripartite theme. Mahler, Schoenberg, Berg, and Webern, contemporary composers. Mm -hmm. And we're going to uh, trace uh, 100 or 125 years of music, 140, I guess, in this program all of pieces which are part of a stream of continuity and which nourish each other over spans of time. Now, the, the, in fact, that whole business of duration and time is, uh, is a fascinating thing to contemplate in the, in the program because the Schoenberg pieces were written in 1911. Yours was written Nine. 50 years later, yes. and Katie's piece was written 50 years after that. I think that says something. Uh, my piece is a young 24-year-old American composer's reaction to Schoenberg's Opus 19 piano pieces. It has a little jazz in it. It has uh, a little more lyricism. It's not anywhere near as profound, although it's got, got some uh, good humor. And it, it's very loving toward the Schoenberg without quoting it or stealing anything or borrowing anything. And it was 50 years afterwards. And so I thought, well, that's that. Now along comes somebody else 50 years later than me and does it. And, and what she achieves, Katie, is a, a whimsical, uh, incredible pastiche sense of humor even, and still with the same fire that the Schoenberg has, fire in the belly, uh, which is very contemporary. It, and it belongs to the year 2011. Mm -hmm. So we think that's significant. I understand that Schoenberg was very, very hard on, on Berg, and in particular the, the clarinet piece that we're going to, to mm -hmm. hear as part of this concert. Right which is a wonderful piece. Schoenberg told Berg, look, Berg, um, all you can do is write vocal music. Let me show you how to write a large instrumental form and, and to have it be self-contained. And Berg wrote the three pieces for orchestra as a result of Schoenberg's teaching. But um, Berg had his own talents, and he was probably vocally and also in terms of opera and drama uh, far more natural than Schoenberg was. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the relationship continued to the point where when Berg wrote Fotzek, and it was a terrific success in 1926 and for years afterwards that he wrote a letter of apology to Schoenberg that the piece was so popular. He said, I must have aimed too low and not lived up to your standard. <laughs> and I want you to forgive me. Uh, so that it was always that student uh, and master relationship. And uh, Do you think there was a degree of envy from, from, from Schoenberg? Schoenberg to Berg, given Berg's success in his lifetime? Probably. Uh, who knows? I'm waiting for a thunderbolt to come through the ceiling and reduce mm. me to a cinder, too, if I answer that in the, in the affirmative. Uh, <laughs> but Schoenberg was very, uh, very firm about who he was and what his stature was, and you didn't um, accuse him of envy. I once asked Kolisch why Schoenberg went nine years without composing from 1915 to 23, after which he came up with a 12-tone idea, which mm. isn't a part of our concert, of course, yeah. because that's a much later development that very few people know. We had free atonality as early as 1908, and the 12-tone music doesn't develop until 1923. So a lot of um, free atonal music is still hauntingly romantic and beautiful in, in my ears. Mm -hmm. And in any event, Schoenberg had a long period of not composing. And I said to Baird, uh, was he blocked? And Baird uh, said to, sorry, to uh, Rudy, was, was Schoenberg blocked? And Rudy got up and walked out to the kitchen, lit a cigar, came back, and sat in front of me at the chessboard blowing smoke in my face kindly because we loved each other. But he finally looked up and said, John, there are some questions that one doesn't ask. And then he uh, pinned my king 
behind my queen with his bishop and won the game. <laughs> That's one of, well, one of the things I learned about uh, Weber recently. We, we know of him as, as being quite a fine cellist, mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't realize that he was the conductor of operettas oh, yes. at one point in his life. I, and when I think of, of Webern and then operettas, it's oil and water. There's a lightness in Webern, though, that goes with that, and a sense of humor behind all the seriousness. Webern was also a great choral conductor and um, required only 50 hours of rehearsal to prepare a single piece, usually. But what he did do was to get a PhD in musicology and to become uh, an expert on the music of Heinrich Isak from the Renaissance. Mm. There are all kinds of things about Webern that we don't know, and the, the formidable sort of avant-gardist that we see, particularly from the way that New York reacted to Webern, he suddenly became very important in New York City in the 50s. It was almost an age of Webern, and then they, the New York Times coined the phrase post-Webern. Uh, that's only one side of him. I, I'll never forget being at a concert in New York where it was all Webern, and, and the music was played as it was in those years, rather stiffly and formally and coldly. But a friend of mine came up to me at intermission, intermission shook my hand and said, Hello, <laughs> on a minor ninth, and I shot back, How are you? And he went, I'm <laughs> fine. And then the whole audience around us was laughing. But what happens with Webern's music is that it is Viennese. It does sing. It is light. It does have humor. And even the more avant-garde pieces were misunderstood in the avant-garde period in the 60s in this country. Mm -hmm. And I think we understand him much better. Lehner, Eugene Lehner of our faculty, told me, please, if you do any Schoenberger, any Berger, any Webern, make sure that all of it sings and that all of it has a lightness of being. And he, Eugene used to speak that way with a very flowing and sweet kind of timbre in his voice. Eugene even once here played the uh, Piero Lunaire on his viola, did the entire Sprechstemme part on his viola. Goodness. And, and had a little concert in Williams Hall that about 50 of us came to him, came to, and it was like listening uh, to Brahms. It was unbelievable. The notes that Schoenberg told you not to sing in, in Piero Lunaire, they're very beautiful. Mm -hmm. So that there are, there are all kinds of secrets in Schoenberg, Berg, and Webern of, of elegant beauty, deep humanity, and, and uh, a sense even of uh, humor. You don't think of uh, Schoenberg as being funny in general, but uh, there's a quality of, of irony that he captures that is sometimes just delicious. Hmm. So I hope that what will come out of the program on November 15th is a sense of a connection between Mahler Schoenberg, Berg, and Weber, and then the three living composers who were on the program, mm -hmm. and that the, uh, the old shibboleth, really, of Schoenberg or Berg or Weber being inscrutable or difficult can just be put to rest once and for all. It's mm -hmm. not even true. Do you think, um, I, when I listened to a, a work of Mahler's like the Tenth Symphony, what was completed in the Tenth Symphony, right. the, the first movement, the Adagio, do you hear in that him striving into a new musical world? Absolutely. It, oh, if only Mahler had lived longer, or Mozart for that matter, or Schubert, you know, a whole uh, other manifestation of, of the human achievement in our art of music would have been possible. Mahler was getting to the cusp of where Schoenberg had already leapt. That, that, yes, I would, that's the, all, always the way I hear it, too. Yeah, yeah absolutely, and it was an attempt uh, in the end of the Ninth Symphony, for instance, uh, to uh, remember tonality as something old and wonderful from the past that was um, ebbing, and mm -hmm. that there was something wonderful just ahead. Mm -hmm. and when I hear the opening of that, 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 that solo viola section with notes going where? I mean, it is so chromatic. Yes. And then the, that central episode with the what I can only refer to as the scream with, with, with those mm -hmm. The chords of all twelve notes of the scale. Yes, I twelve think. notes of the scale in one uh, and, chord. And and then and then the that scream from the trumpet. I mean, mm -hmm. it, he's pointing. In my in my thoughts, he's pointing to a new direction. Certainly, and a new direction that is filled with uh, anxiety, and also hope, and love for the past and love for the future, and an attempt to bridge these um, chasms. You know. It, it, it could be said that on January 1st, 1900, the bells rang and everybody said, a new era is here. And uh, I think what Schoenberg and Mahler uh, tried to achieve was a bridge 
between the old world and the new world and to show that there was actually a continuity, not even a revolution, but an evolution.